and welcome to the second invited talk, given by Dan Bernstein. Dan is one of the few members of our community who does not need introduction. It's a great honor and pleasure that you be prepared to give a talk here. So Dan has a PhD from UC Berkeley from 95. He's a professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago and part-time also at TU Eindhoven. If I would start reading his CV, I would actually take most of his time, so I would not do that. Just a few things you may know Dan from. When he was a PhD student, he sued the US government about export controls. Um, he also, in 2004, found close to 100 unique security holes with his students in a class on this. He's the author of QMail, DGBA DNS. He's known for his work on factoring and ECC, but I guess today we want to hear more about um, his work in symmetric cryptology. So Dan, designer of Poppy 1305 AES, of Celsa 20, of Fugue Hash, and he's also running together with Tanya at Epax. So I will leave it here. So please join me in welcoming Dan Bernstein. Thanks for the introduction. Can I get a check? Is the microphone working? No, it has to be on the right side. It has to be on the other side. Okay, let's try moving it. Okay, checking again. Is the microphone working? No. 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 You have to push a button. Okay, third time. Is it working? Yes. All right, great. So, thank you for the introduction. Thanks to the organizers for the invitation. I've decided to start out with some quotes about the relationship between cryptography and information security. I see cryptography as a critical part of information security, but let's see what some other people think. First of all, XKCD. For those of you who might not be able to read it from the back, the left side there has a bad guy saying, his laptop's encrypted. Let's build a million dollar cluster to crack it. And then the other bad guy says, no good. It's 4,096-bit RSA. And the first bad guy says, blast, our evil plan is foiled. Now this is labeled a crypto nerd's imagination. And on the right side, it says, what would actually happen? And there the bad guy says, his laptop's encrypted. Drug him and hit him with his $5 wrench until he tells us the password. The other bad guy says, got it. And then there's another maybe similar quote from Greg and Gutmann from 2011, saying in the past 15 to 20 years, no one ever lost money to an attack on a properly designed crypto system. Uh, what, what is a properly designed crypto system? How does the user tell? Well, they give a definition. They say it's one that doesn't use homebrew crypto or toy keys in the internet or commercial world. And I have another quote from, uh, oops, there we go, from Shamir saying, crypto is usually bypassed. I'm not aware, Shamir says, of any major world-class security system employing cryptography in which the hackers penetrated the system by actually going through the cryptanalysis. Now, I'm not quite sure what these uh, quotes mean. I mean, first of all, it, it's clear from the XKCD that the bad guys are unable to break the crypto. But what about this Greg Gutmann quote, and what about this Shamir quote? Are they saying that the cryptography is actually infeasible to break? Or are they saying that, well, it's feasible to break the, the real world crypto, but um, the attackers have easier things to do? And that's certainly all of the quotes I've given have this theme of, yeah, there's, there's easier things than, than going through the cryptography. Well, Shamir very clearly says this, um, that the, the, uh, when the hackers penetrate the system, they're not actually going through the cryptanalysis and saying, well, uh, XK, it's amazing that a uh, comic strip is more clear than uh, other people commenting on information security. Um, <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, there's another possibility, which is that what these people mean, namely that, that cryptography is not the weak point, that the attackers are not breaking the cryptography, either because it's not feasible or because it's feasible to break, but there's easier attacks. Maybe they're just wrong about all of this. So maybe the real world cryptography is, is actually breakable, and it's actually being broken, along with lots of other things. And if we, if we actually want to secure a system, then we have to fix the crypto and fix all the other things that are going wrong. Um, so it's, it's not some strong point in, in security. It's actually one of many weak points in security that we have to fix. Well, to resolve this question, let's look at some examples, starting with Flame. Now, the target here is the Windows Update System. Flame is some malware that broke into a bunch of computers, targeted a bunch of computers around the Middle East, mostly in Iran. 
And Microsoft announced uh, about a week after Flame was publicly discovered, Microsoft said, we recently became aware of a complex piece of targeted malware known as Flame and immediately began examining the issue. A bunch of computers are broken into, it's an issue. Okay, we have discovered through our analysis, so clever we are, that some components of the malware have been signed by certificates that allow software to appear as if it was produced by Microsoft. They broke our signature system, oops. So Microsoft has a Windows update system where any Windows machine will accept updates to Windows if they're signed by Microsoft. And the attackers, one of the main ways that Flame broke into computers, well, the main way that Flame targeted computers, was by forging a signature, which appeared to come from Microsoft. And the targeted computers looked at that signature and said, oh yeah, that's Valve. Now, this sounds like a PKC issue rather than an FSE issue, until you look at how they forge signatures, namely a chosen prefix attack, chosen prefix collision attack against MD5. Mark Stevens has a nice tool where he will look at a, a colliding message, not a colliding pair of messages, a colliding message. He'll try XORing it with a bunch of plausible message differences and then tracking it through MD5 and seeing if there's an internal collision. And so he was able to look at the flame message, the signed flame, you know, the, the flame signature, and say, yes, that is part of a chosen prefix collision attack, which is not his optimized collision attack. It's something different, it's something entirely new and unknown. Now, the concept of new here is a little interesting because if you look at another report from the Crisis Lab, that was one of the first labs to uh, find Flame and analyze what it was doing, they said that they have, there's a bunch of machines around the internet where they, they have virus protection and so on, but maybe people get through the virus protection, the malware protection, Flame, of course, got through lots of protections, and um, these machines will still keep logs of everything that they're doing and send the logs off to, to other sites for analysis later. So it's possible to go back and see what was on those machines historically. And in particular, one of those machines in its logs in 2007 had one of the critical flame files. Now, the conclusion from this lab was that flame was probably already active in 2007, which was before the real damage of MD5, not just that there are collisions, but you can use them for, for forging certificates. That was before that was publicly known, before it was uh, established in the public cryptographic community. And they think that Flame was perhaps active for even as long as eight years. Now, if you go back to 2007, again, problems known with MD5. People were saying in the mid-90s, MD5 is a bad function, don't use it. But people were still deploying MD5 in 2007. There wasn't this rush to get rid of it in 2007. So MD5 was not homebrew crypto. It was something which was standardized, widely used, and nevertheless, the attackers broke it. And apparently they thought that this was one of the easiest things for them to do. They didn't bother with some other attack which would have been harder. The crypto was the weak point in the system. At least it was the point that the attackers decided to break. If you compare this to what Brig and Gutmann are saying, they say things like crypto system failure is orders of magnitude below any other risk. And this is obviously a little bit of an exaggeration, but nevertheless, that's what they say. The crypto's fine, the crypto's strong, we're done. Crypto is successful. Mission accomplished. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at another example. There was a nice talk about web yesterday. I have just two slides here um, saying a little bit about the History, I would give some credit to Borisov and Goldberg and Wagner, who in 2001, this was a flurry of attack papers a few years after uh, what was standardized, um, wire equivalent privacy turns out to have, as you heard yesterday, a 24 bit message number. So you have this long term secret key, which is 40 bits or 104 bits, and then you put on a 24-bit message number to get your 64 or 128-bit RC4 key, and that message number is never supposed to repeat. Of course, a 24-bit number is going to be very frequently repeating, and when it does, then all sorts of things go wrong with the crypto. You lose all your confidentiality, you lose all your integrity, so it's already a complete disaster just from having a 24-bit message number used for a long-term key. And then uh, the user authentication fails, and then Fleur, Munson, and Shamir started off the types of attacks that you heard about in the talk yesterday, where because the long-term key is concatenated with this message number, and there's correlations between the key bytes, the long-term key bytes, and the RC4 outputs, um, which you can see when you vary the, the, the message number, 
um, you end up seeing the key bytes from a bunch of RC4 outputs. And then, well, lots and lots of papers about this, perhaps concluding with the uh, paper from yesterday saying uh, you can really optimize this attack to the point of getting the WEP secret key from under 20,000 packets. So incredibly weak cryptographic system. Now, some people look at this and say, OK, you're pointing to a bunch of academic papers. And sure, WEP is still used in the real world, and it's weak. The academic papers do say that. But come on, who's actually being attacked? Well, here's an example of somebody being attacked. Um, some attackers stole 45 million credit card numbers and a bunch of other personally identifiable information from an American company, TJ Maxx, by, first of all, breaking into the internal network, which was protected with WEP. Now, a company in the US, when there's um, people losing money or maybe gaining money, there's a whole subculture of other financial uh, research companies which will look around and speculate about how much it's going to cost them. And so Forrester Research said TJ Maxx is going to be losing something on the scale of a billion dollars from this, which is maybe correct with all the consulting fees and cleanups. The only documented damage I'm aware of is that TJ Maxx paid $40.9 million to settle a lawsuit about exactly this theft. So nobody loses any money. Well, okay, here's an example of somebody losing money because of broken crypto. Let's try another example. Keylock. This is one of these uh, rip -rip systems for car doors and garage doors. Wikipedia says here's a bunch of car companies which have deployed it. Um, there's a paper in 2007, Indistaka and Keller and Liam and Ruffelman and Bart Cornell, called How to Steal Cars. And what this says is that the, the security of the cipher used here, this key lock cipher, it doesn't give you 64 bit 2 to the 64 security. You can break it using only 2 to the 44.5 encryptions and 2 to the 16 known plain tests. Now, when I see numbers like, like this, then I start envisioning, OK, what does that mean? 2 to the 44 computations. I've got some idea how key lock works. OK, what does that computation mean? And then how about the known plain tests? 2 to the 16 known plain tests. OK, OK. For those of you who don't know our session chair, Bart Cornell is a parking valet at a very fancy restaurant. Now, rich people come to the restaurant, and they give him their cars and their car keys temporarily. Uh, of course, if he steals the car at that point with the car key, then they know it's him, and he gets fired and gets in trouble. Um, but if he can clone the key and then give back the car, and then sell the cloned key on the black market, and then a week or a month later, the car gets stolen. Nobody knows it was him. So he drives uh, the car away, parks the car, and now he's got a little radio receiver, which receives the key lock signals. And he also has a second job as a professor. So he has a bunch of graduate students, and he gives the key to the graduate student and says, OK, graduate student, push this key as fast as you can. <laughs> OK, if you, if you push it at, a, I actually tried this, at a reasonable speed, then it takes about three hours, uh, extrapolating, it takes about three hours to get two to the 16 pushes. And then um, fancy restaurant, three hours for dinner, perfectly reasonable. You know, sometimes it takes a long time for them to give you the bill and for the valet to bring your car back. Um, and then, well, by, by listening to the radio signals and doing a little bit of computation, he ends up getting the, uh, the remote key and then being able to build clones up. Then there was a paper the next year from Eisenhart and Kasper and Murati and Parr and Thomas Zada and Shalmani saying that they have a much faster attack where they can, from some distance, intercept the radio signals of pushing the button once or twice and then immediately build a clone of the key. Having done a lot of initial computation to get the, the manufacturer keys out of these systems. So it turns out that the receivers for these signals inside cars, inside garage doors um, from each of these companies, they all share a, a manufacturer key. And the main work that was done here was actually extracting the manufacturer keys from interactions with those devices, the receiving devices. Now, some people would say that these uh, authors of the second paper were cheating because this was a side channel attack. They weren't just looking at the legitimate radio signals that were designed to be outputs of the system. They were looking at the power consumed by the system. Now, 
Maybe Shamir would say that this was bypassing the cryptography. Maybe it's uh, not an issue that cryptographers should worry about, that there's these side channel attacks. There should be some other people who are protecting us against side channel attacks. But maybe there are interactions between the cryptography and the side channels. Maybe we can change the decisions that we make. And there's more and more evidence of this, that there are different decisions we can make in designing cryptographic systems, which make the side channel attacks harder or easier to carry out. Another question that I'll formulate about this attack, I don't have any examples here of press about news stories about people who are stealing cars using these attacks. So some people would look at this and say, hey, there's all these academic papers, yeah, it's theoretically weak, but no attackers would ever carry this out in practice. There's no evidence that anybody's actually breaking the key lock system. Now, okay, suppose you have two academic teams. They find an attack against Keylock, and the first thing, if an attacker finds a break against a widely deployed system like this, there is a 100% chance they will call the New York Times, or some equivalent organization. If a real attacker breaks the system, then what's the chance they're going to call the New York Times? They don't want anybody to know they're breaking the system, so let's say there's a 0% chance the real attacker is going to call the New York Times. Now, the New York Times articles are then two academic teams times 100% plus n real attacks times 0%, which gives us a total of two articles. Now, what does this tell us about n? Well, some people think that this means there are no real attacks. I, I think this doesn't tell us anything. If the system is weak, then it is presumably being broken by real attackers, even if we don't have news stories. Let me give you another example. VMware View. So this one is maybe not so well known. This is one of these corporate, you buy thousands of terminals from your company, from some company you buy from, say, Dell, and uh, these terminals are going to have little desktops where the desktop environment that your user is talking to is actually generated on a server. So you have some centrally managed server, thousands of terminals, all using some protocol, VMware View, to uh, send the graphics from the central server to the user so the user can interact with the computer system. Now, if you look at the documentation from VMware or from Dell, then they say you're supposed to switch from AES-128 to Salsa-20-256, whatever that is, for the best user experience. Now, okay, this is faster. The, the best user experience refers to there's some speed limit for the hardware here, something like 5 megabits per second of, of network graphics, which AES can successfully encrypt. And if you switch to something faster on that hardware, then you will get faster graphics and the users are happier. So they recommend that. And normally, cryptographically, I would say that this is also a good thing to do, that this is increasing your, well, key size, it's increasing your number of rounds, the security margin. There's lots of reason that, that this is a reasonable thing to do for speed and security. But let's look at the documentation. All right, I'll run through this slowly. AES-128. According to the protocol documentation, it is AES 128 GCM. Salsa 2256, according to the documentation, is Salsa 2256 <coughs> round 12. Now, does anybody see the problem here? Let's see. Authenticated encryption, says the parking valet. Okay. <laughs> uh, AES GCM is not just encryption, it's also authenticating your messages so they can't be forged. Now this Salsa 2256 with 12 rounds, uh, maybe, I mean, it, it could include some authentication that they just aren't saying anything about, but uh, I see no evidence that they are including any authentication. So as far as I know, I haven't actually tried buying one of these things and carrying out an attack, but as far as I know, I mean, if it's doing just what that would suggest, uh, this is completely vulnerable to packet forgery, where AES-GCM is not. So, at least from all the available documentation about this, I would say even though switching from AES to Salsa 20, I'm generally happy with, switching from AES with authentication to Salsa 20 without authentication, that's a really bad idea. The user doesn't need just encryption, the user needs encryption and authentication. There's tons and tons of examples like this where the Cryptography is failing because it's, it's barely even being deployed. The IPsec null authentication is one of the most common ways to deploy virtual private networks. You have 
a protocol which could have some authentication built in, but the user actually does no authentication. And then they get surprised when their packets get forged. Okay, let's try another example. SSL. Now, in SSL, there's lots of stages to it. I'll focus on the, the secret key part as for this entire talk. Uh, what SSL should be doing is nothing at all like this, but let's start with CBC, normal AES CBC encryption. So you have a bunch of plain text blocks, P0, P1, P2, say 16 bytes each, 48 byte message. You encrypt each block by applying AES to it where you add something to each block. So you add the previous ciphertext block C0 to P1 and then feed, feed that into AES, get C1, add that to P2, feed it through AES, get C2, and you send along C0, C1, C2. Now at the beginning, the first P0, there's no C sub minus 1. So what you're supposed to do is generate a random number, which could be, for example, you encrypt a nonce, but somehow you generate a random number, somehow make sure the other side knows the random number, send along that number or, or have them implicitly know the nonce. Somehow the other side knows B, and you add that random B to P0. Okay, so that's AES CBC, standard AES CBC encryption. Now here's what SSL does. You take, well, very much the same thing. You take each ciphertext block, add to the next plain text block, and then feed it through AES to get the next ciphertext block. Except at the very beginning, instead of making a random number, SSL takes the last ciphertext block from the previous packet. So it sends a packet along, C sub minus 3, C sub minus 2, C sub minus 1, and then it gets the next uh, packet to send from the user, P0, P1, P2, and adds that previous last C sub minus 1, which was sent along in the previous packet, sends that, uh, adds that to P0, and then encrypts that. Now the problem here, the order of operations is very important, that because the attacker can see this last plain text, sorry, last cipher text before choosing this next plain text, the attacker can choose P0 as a function of C sub minus 1. In particular, it can choose P0 to be C sub minus 1 exclusive or something, where the something is, for example, allowing him to guess some previous plain text block. So, this is none of the random collisions that you were hearing about in David and Bruce's talk. This is the attacker can actively say, okay, I've got a guess for, say, P sub minus 3. And I'm going to take that guess, exclusive work with C sub minus 4. So that's what was encrypted before. If the guess is correct, that's what was encrypted to get C sub minus 3. And then I'll XOR it with C sub minus 1 and put that into P sub 0. So if the attacker is trying to guess some previous plain text and controls this next plain text, then he does this. If the guess is correct, then the AES encryption of P0 plus C minus 1, which is exactly what, whoops, what SSL sends through AES right here and gives C sub 0, that's exactly the same as P sub minus 3 plus C sub minus 4, which gets encrypted to get C sub minus 3. So the attacker simply compares C0 to C minus 3 and then sees that his guess is correct, or that it's not, and then he tries more guesses. As long as there's not much entropy in this piece of minus 3, the attacker quickly figures out what piece of minus 3 is. So a complete failure of the encryption to actually protect the data. Greg Bard in 2006 said, OK, if you've got a browser running an applet maybe, then it could carry out this attack. There's no clear obstacles to carrying out this attack. It, it should be able to repeatedly carry out guesses. And then this was actually implemented some years later by Duong and Rizzo. It's called the beast attack against browsers, um, you know, browser exploit against SSL TLS. And this really does work, and it really does get a, a cookie out of the browser in something like two minutes. So browsers, browser vendors look at this attack and say, OK, what are we going to do? We'll send along, before we, OK, we get this P0, P1, P2 from the user. And before we encrypt that, before we add P0 to something, we're going to insert another packet before that where that other packet doesn't have any data. It just has a message authenticator, which I'll get to in a moment. Every packet has a message authenticator. So the browser sends an empty piece of data with a message authenticator, then sends P0, P1, P2, with its, well, that, which includes a message authenticator. And because there's that extra message authenticator before the P0, that randomizes the ciphertext block that's used to add to the P0. So the, the uh, packet that gets sent is committed to before the C sub minus 1 is, uh, is generated. 
and that's enough to make things secure. It doesn't quite work because uh, empty data actually breaks Internet Explorer, but what browsers do instead is they take one byte of the uh, legitimate packet, send that along, then send all the remaining bytes. And that's probably secure, and uh, it's actually deployed today. Now the attacker, instead of uh, controlling the plain text, could try controlling the cipher text, sending along forged network packets. But that doesn't work because, like I just said, each packet includes an authenticator. Each SSL packet has a, a MAC, which is protecting it against forgery. And the way that works is SSL takes the legitimate data, puts an authenticator on the end, and then, oops, CDC needs to have 16 times some number of bytes. It has to have an even number of blocks. So SSL takes the authenticated data, puts some padding on it, and then encrypts with CBC. And that padding is something like put on one one, two two, three threes, whatever you need to get to uh, a full multiple of the AES boxes. Okay. And this is it's a little complicated, but you can look at it and prove. Paper by Krawczyk in 2001 says this is provably secure. Now this is like a moment in an action movie when you have, you know, the, the, there's a fight going on and then suddenly the camera is looking at some barrels that are full of oil and you just know they're going to explode. So this is brutally <laughs> secure. Um, Bonnet in 2001, I think this was presented at the, uh, the Crypto Rump session right before Krumchik's talk. <laughs> Say so this is completely broken if you have a padding oracle. If you can tell the difference between a padding failure on decryption and a MAC failure. So the, the receiver has to decrypt with CBC, check the padding, and then check the authenticator. And if there's a way to tell the difference, for example, different error messages for these different failures, then in almost no time the attacker can figure out any plain text for any ciphertext box that he wants. Now, this if in this statement was, as far as I know, first demonstrated to be correct by Canvell in 2003, who said, you know, there, there is one of these padding oracles where, here, let's watch the time that the server takes receiving this data. If the padding is incorrect, then it's fast to reject that block. If the padding is correct, then it has to compute it back, and that takes longer. So by watching the timing of the receiver of this SSL encrypted data, you can get exactly the padding oracle you need for Vodnay's attack to work. So what do browsers do? Well, they say, OK, OK, let's always compute the MAC so that there's no longer this timing difference between having a padding failure and having a, an authenticator failure. And then just a month ago, Alfarden and Patterson in the Lucky 13 attack said, OK, we can still break it. Because there's still some very, very small timing differences between having the padding failing and having the authenticator failing. Okay. So what does SSL do about this? Uh, there's obvious reactions like, okay, really try to control the timing, and this is hundreds and hundreds of lines of code with all sorts of bugs just to deal with the timing issues here. Incredibly fragile system. But SSL TLS has an alternative to this, which is called cryptographic agility. Now, cryptographic agility is a marketing stunt, which has two parts. Uh, maybe the second part first. Cryptographic algorithm agility means that you have some button which says, press in case of emergency, and then you will switch to different crypto. Nobody's ever tried the button. Whether it works doesn't matter, because it's a marketing stunt. Then the other part of cryptographic algorithm agility is because you have that button saying, push if the crypto is failing, emergency, because you have that button, you don't bother having good crypto. You don't care whether your crypto is actually working, whether it's secure. You just say, oh, if there's a problem, we'll push the button. So everything's just fine. Now, as an example of the button not working, there is AES GCM, which has all of its own timing problems, but at least it would get rid of the basic problems with CBC. SSL, in theory, can switch, TLS 1.2 can switch to AES GCM. But it doesn't work. Because you try turning it on, you find that 90% of web servers and basically 100% of web browsers don't actually understand it. OK, so what do you do instead? Well, there is one alternative to AES CBC or other CBC modes, which is supported by all of the clients, all the servers out there, and which you can just turn on 
and that you really do have, uh, here's the emergency backup plan, in case of failure of ASCBC, you switch to RC4. And more and more sites are in fact doing this. Uh, this is now more than 50% of SSL connections on the internet. And lots and lots of people are recommending switching to this because it's obviously much less fragile than AES CDC. There's even statements from Reves, which people keep quoting as saying that RC4 is okay in SSL. It's not as bad as Web. Web takes a long-term key, puts on a well, sort of nonce, and then uh, uses that in RC4. SSL does not do that. SSL takes a uh, whole public key setup and then does some reasonable hash to generate a one-time RC4 key, and then when it's done with that, it never generates any related keys. Good, sensible. There's no reason to ask for related key attacks. And Revest says uh, the attacks against web don't apply to SSL with RC4. Designers of applications using RC4 should not be concerned. <coughs> However, some of the problems with RC4 are a reason for concern. There's all these biases in RC4 output bytes. And at this point, I'd like to advertise something I've been doing very recently with Alfarden and Patterson and Fleming <coughs> and Schulte, which is called On the Security of RC4 and TLS, which is at the highest level saying, OK, you can actually do very much what Beast does, where instead of targeting AES, encrypting a cookie with CBC, you target RC4 encrypting a cookie and then have, well, the same cookie or password or whatever sent through a lot of RC4 sessions, the same way that Beast does, and then use the biases in RC4 in order to figure out what the cookie is from all of these ciphertext bytes. Now, what are these biases? Well, those of you who were paying attention yesterday heard about uh, some of what I'll say here. Uh, first of all, the, the best known one is that the second byte of RC4 output is biased towards zero, has a probability of 2 over 256 of being zero instead of 1 over 256 that you would expect. That's from Rotten and Shamir. And then Miranov looked at Z1 and found that Z1 is biased away from zero, away from one, towards two, and I, it's a totally weird distribution of the first output byte of RC4. And then, much more recently, Maitra and Paul and Senhupta observed that Z3 and Z4 and so on through Z255 all have more than 1 over 256 chance of being zero, which is contrary to something that Montin and Chenier were claiming, that they were exactly balanced, all those other Z survives. Um, and then the key length dependent bias for people who were paying attention yesterday, uh, Z sub 16, the 16th output byte is biased towards minus 16, assuming your key length is 16 bytes, 128 bits. Okay, that's not nearly the end of it. So here's what, with my co-authors, uh, the conclusions are. There are 256 squared biases in the first 256 bytes of RC4 output, almost 256 squared. So we computed for every position, 1 through 256, and for every possibility for the ith output byte, what is the chance that the ith output byte of RC4 is 0, is 1, is 2, etc. And basically, none of those probabilities are 1 over 256. Now, as a result of that, you can use all of these biases, doing sensible statistics, to attack SSL. The paper from yesterday was a little earlier, and certainly independent, but I think it was also <coughs> the results were found a little earlier than ours. Um, we're saying some of the, the bigger biases, which I've listed here. So let me show you some, some pictures of what the actual probabilities look like. First of all, here's the first output byte, which again, from Miranov, was already known to be a very strange distribution. So what the graph means, um, taking, for example, here. At 129, the value of this graph is uh, 0 0.993. That means the probability of the first output byte from RC4 being 129 is 0.993 divided by 256. It should be 1 over 256. It should be a flat line, but no, RC4 is biased against 129, against 0, and well, towards some bytes here, away from other bytes. And you see there's some, some fuzziness here. This is actual biases, uh, plus and minus. I mean, there's every, every 16 values of, of the byte value x, there really is a spike up or down, as you see in this graph. There's also, if you look at Marinov's data about this, for some reason, the very negative spike here didn't appear. 
Um, the, these initial values, the initial output bytes of RC4, are not too useful in attacking SSL because the first few bytes are used to basically encrypt random data. But let's look at some follow-up bytes. Um, well, Z2 is still not in the useful range, but just to indicate the graph, the Montan Shamir bias says the probability of Z2 being zero is up at 2 over 256, so way off the graph. Uh, but then there's also all these other spikes up and down that you see, and lots of little fuzziness that you see in a general upwards tilt. And then moving on to Z3, well, the big things you notice are, well, there's a bias towards zero, there's a bias towards three. That's one of the things that we saw in this also in this paper from yesterday. Uh, there's this bias towards 131. And then also, if you look closer, you can see some little bumps up and down. Even with a, without zooming in on the PDF here, you can see, uh, for instance, maybe this bump down. Uh, if we move along in some bytes, you can see now that bump is up and then down and up and down and up and down. Just the, the little bite there along with some biases towards uh, other positions. And while well, it goes on for a while, eventually you see the key length dependent biases, like here's this bias towards minus 16. And this is starting to get into the range where you can use this to attack SSL. <laughs> we keep going like this. So for instance, here's uh, Z33. And, oh, I should have emphasized back at Z31. There's this funny fuzziness to it. What a weird thing. Um, <laughs> Z33, as an example, there's these two big biases towards 0, towards 33. Now, suppose you're looking at a bunch of ciphertexts, which are encrypting the same plaintext byte at that position, and you see that the most common ciphertext byte is, say, 1. Now, that could be that the plaintext byte was 1, exclusive or was 0. Or it could be that it was uh, 1, exclusive or 33, which would be 32. How do you tell the difference between them? Well, if you, all you know is those two spikes, then that's the best you can do. But if you see the whole distribution, and you think, what is this whole distribution XORed with 33? And that totally changes the shape of this curve, makes a huge difference if you XOR it with something. So you can get a lot more information from seeing the entire graph than just what you get from seeing the big spikes in the graph. And it goes on like this for a while. Uh, you can, maybe you can see uh, things like, under the mouse, there's this little bump which is jumping along by 16. But okay, enough admiring graphs. You can go back to slides online afterwards. And it, eventually, it seems like the bias is kind of smoothed out as we get to by 150, 200 or so. Eventually, the bias, like the bias by 221, bias towards zero, bias towards 221, but it's more bias towards 222, 223, and so on. Then this tilt upward is very weird. And then eventually you get to byte 255, and you start feeling like, at this point, it's almost a reasonable cipher. It's got this bias towards zero. Maybe we could deal with that somehow. It's maybe got a slight tilt up and down, but it, it almost looks kind of flat. And then you get to the next byte, and it's tilted. <laughs> Incredible. OK, so we applied this to actually attacking. Uh, as a cell situation of having a lot of uh, uh, plain text being repeated in a lot of ciphertext. And then here's the probabilities we get, for example, from 2 to the 24 ciphertext with arbitrary um, plain text data. Uh, there was a similar graph drawn yesterday where instead of, say, the 30% probability you see at the beginning bytes here, it was about a 10% probability. So there's a big advantage to taking all the biases into account and doing the statistics properly. And then if you have more ciphertext, you get up to say 2 to the 28 ciphertext. And then in the interesting region for SSL, you get complete plain text recovery. OK. So why does this happen? Why do we have all of these breakable cryptographic examples? Well, you could say it's because the people who were implementing cryptographic protocols haven't gotten the memo. In many of these cases, they were doing the implementations years before AES, so maybe they shouldn't be blamed. But at this point, we just have to educate them, right? I mean, we just have to explain to them there's AES. 
And ABS does not have these problems. Well, maybe side channel problems, but um, we, we also know ways to defend AES against side channel attacks. We have AES GCM. That's got the authentication. It's maybe, uh, maybe the words AES GCM, maybe that doesn't express to your average user, this includes authentication and you need authentication. But somehow we can educate them that AES GCM is what they need, authenticated encryption. And then, again, we can protect the whole AES GCM, everything you need in secret key crypto, we can protect that against side channel attacks. So we just have to explain this to people doing crypto. Except, maybe, AES GCM is not actually what they need. Maybe AES GCM is mm, kind of meeting some of the user re requirements, but not meeting others. And the most obvious requirement that it's not meeting, especially with side channel protection, but sometimes even without, is performance. The users have some performance requirements. Here I'll quote some random examples. Revest, again, from 2001. The heart of RC4 is its exceptionally simple and extremely efficient pseudo-random generator. RC4 is likely to remain the algorithm of choice for many applications and embedded systems. And that's correct. RC4 has remained the algorithm of choice for many applications and embedded systems, in part because of the speed. You can find Adam Langley from Google online only a few years ago, something like two years ago, saying, here's the advantages of RC4. Here's why we prefer RC4 at Google. Number one, it's fast. Number two, CBC has a bad history, and it goes on to other reasons, but it's fast. Everybody knows that RC4 on a lot of platforms is fast. On a typical ARM chip, it's twice as fast as AES. And so it's, it's something which people like because of the speed. And if people need that kind of speed, AES is not an option. Another example, OpenSSL in AES for extra speed is not doing what they should be doing for side channel protection. So OpenSSL is leaking a bunch of key bits to side channel attacks. For instance, in this financial crypto paper 2012 from Bison, Hines, and Stoop, um, OpenSSL is leaking something like half of the AES key bits to a very straightforward side channel attack because they're not doing what they should be doing in the implementations. And why aren't they doing it? Well, you look through the thousands of lines of comments in the AES implementation in OpenSSL, and they say it's because of the speed. They want better speed than they can get from a side channel protected implementation. Another example here, different from speed, is the size. If you have a, a small chip, very low cost chip, or a chip which has to do more than just the crypto and fit into low cost, that, for instance, RFID applications, you really need a small cipher lightweight crypto having a cipher that fits into small area, and then maybe it also still needs to be fast. It's an incredible challenge. And the users can't just throw away these requirements. They really want the crypto to be fast. They need the crypto to be fast. And how do we give it to them? Well, there's all sorts of work on trying to make this happen. And I think this is one of the critical directions of continued research into secret key crypto is trying to do things which are better than what we have now, in particular better than, say, AES GCM where you don't have to reduce the security level to improve performance. I mean, AES has this huge 8-bit S-Box, where it's taking 8 bits of data and then scrambling them, scrambling them, scrambling them, and it's taking this huge hardware circuit, huge amount of energy, just to totally mangle 8 bits of data. And that's overkill. There's lots and lots of ciphers that do better than AES in all sorts of performance measures by not doing that overkill, by having smaller S-Boxes than AES does. There's all sorts of fundamental constraints on what the users want, like they want the power to be smaller, some limit on how much power they can feed into the cryptographic circuit, so they can't do an incredible amount in parallel. There's often limits on area. There's often limits on latency. You have a time that you can spend until you, uh, maybe microseconds instead of seconds, but some limit on the time until you get your encrypted, authenticated data. Maybe what attracts the most attention is the throughput, the speed, the, the number of bytes per second which you really should turn around into area times the amount of time per byte, because otherwise somebody can always increase the bytes per second by doing two parallel uh, encryption units, and then they get twice the area and uh, half the seconds per byte. Well, to, to not be trivially allowing the throughput to go through the roof, you should be multiplying the area times the time. And then similarly, you can optimize the energy, the battery life of your cryptographic algorithms which is basically optimize the number of bit operations you need to do crypto, except 
If you're doing lots of big random access to big tables, that consumes a huge amount of energy. Also makes the area of time look bad. There's lots and lots of platforms for doing this. And of course, I mean, just to briefly summarize a lot of the research, and this would be a whole hour talk, of all the different ways that people have been improving the performance of authentication and encryption, improving the performance of secret key crypto. There's, of course, lots of different application environments where maybe you have long plain text, maybe you have short plain text, maybe you actually want to encrypt five byte plain text all the time. Can you save time by only having five bytes of encryption instead of 16 bytes of encryption? Tons and tons of optimization work and design work to make secret key crypto meet the user's performance requirements. One of the questions that I find most interesting is whether there's a way for one design to meet lots and lots of application requirements, to be good in particular for hardware and for software. <coughs> I think a lot of people say, oh, hardware optimization of ciphers looks like this, software optimization looks like that, and you really can't do both at the same time. But there's some great examples of ciphers which are optimized for hardware, but they're still pretty good in software. Trivium, Ketchak, these are well, catch act used in, say, an authenticated encryption mode, like the, the duplex mode. Um, these are ciphers which are designed for hardware, designed to be really, really good in hardware, and they are really, really good in hardware, but they actually also provide pretty good software performance. So you can try to start from ideas like that, see what makes them work well in both of these environments, and try to do even better. Or you can say, let's start from the software designs and see what's making them not so good, maybe, in hardware. So, one suggestion here is to replace ARX, add rotate XOR, with ORX, or rotate XOR. Now, if you remember the same mix from earlier today, uh, you can't do that with OR because OR doesn't give you the invertibility for a scheme mix. But you can do, say, the basic operation in Salsa 20, where you take two state variables, you, instead of adding them together, you OR them together, you rotate by some fixed amount, and then you XOR that into another state variable. And that's invertible, and well, it's not as much diffusion across bits as uh, addition, but it's still okay. It gives you this is enough to build whatever sort of uh, whatever sort of cipher you want. You can build any function out of this if you want. You probably need a few more rounds for good diffusion than what you get from an ARX design. But hardware people are going to be much much happier with ORs than they are with additions. Additions are these huge carry chains. Hardware people are constantly complaining and doing an ORX design should be much, much better for hardware. I say it without having actually tried. Something else you can do, which I've seen lots of papers on, and I think it's one of the most important directions. It's not something where uh, it, it's maybe motivated by current problems in, in cryptography, but we're clearly going to have more problems along these lines in the future of our security not being good enough. It's one thing to say, okay, we've got something secure like AES GCM, it's not fast enough. Let's make something that security level that's faster. But how about when people get to the security level of AES GCM and say that's not as secure as we need? For instance, the 128 bit block size starts breaking down horribly once you've encrypted 2 to the 64 blocks. Even 2 to the 60, you start getting failures. Some modes, 2 to the 40, you start getting failures. That's not that many blocks to encrypt. So maybe we should have some of these birthday, beyond the birthday bounds modes where we don't worry about 2 to the 64, we can encrypt much more. Or maybe we should have instead of 128-bit blocks, maybe we should have 192 or 256-bit blocks. Now, another direction of uh, smallness in our current ciphers, authenticated ciphers like ASGCM, the, the authentication, I guess there will be a, a talk, well, the very next talk, today is exactly about uh, what security do we get out of the authentication in AES GCM. And there's a 128-bit key pipe inside GCM, which is really starting to feel uncomfortable. And some people would say for these kinds of issues, oh, the, the problem with having a 128-bit a, a block with, say, counter mode, which breaks down at the birthday bound, and some people would say the problem is counter mode and use a better mode. Some people would say use a bigger block. Same thing here with a 128-bit pipe you're going to have some people saying, well, your mode is not making the most effective use of that pipe. You should be changing your mode so that it's, it's safer. And some people would say, your pipe should be bigger. Can you do that efficiently? For instance, something I haven't seen people looking at 
there's all these optimizations of 128-bit universal hash functions, polynomial hashes. Say. Has anybody looked at 192-bit, 256-bit? I don't think 256-bit should be twice as slow. I think it should be maybe 20%, 30% slower. But I haven't seen anybody try it. And I think it would be a really cool thing to have for bigger, more secure design. Maybe the extra security issue that's attracted the most attention is misuse resistance. So instead of insisting that the message number be a nonce, that somebody only use that number once, how about allow the message number to be repeated? Now, of course, if somebody has two different messages, M and M prime, and they encrypt them with the same message number, they're going to get different ciphertext if they were different messages, or if they were the same message, they'll get the same ciphertext. So there is a leak to the attacker if the message number is repeated. I mean, the message number repetition leaks the message repetition. But users get surprised if the message number repetition is, is making the uh, authentication fail, for example, or leaking the XOR of messages, or leaking much more information. So one proposal for dealing with this is to do authenticate, then encrypt. And if you're careful about the details, this is the SIV mode from Rogwood and Shrimpton. What they say is you take your whole message number and message, you authenticate that with something that has to be a little stronger than just an authenticator, but do some appropriate thing to, to look through the whole nonce and message, well, message number and message, and then use that result as if it were a nonce. So that's something which would be a nonce if the n changed or if the m changed, and then use that to encrypt and counterload the whole message. Now, this should, well, you can prove if you do the details right, uh, this will protect against all of these uh, message number repetition attacks, except for linking does the message repeat. But it also comes at some performance cost, which I think is maybe not uh, primarily the cost of looking through the message twice, but what worries me the most is if you're in a denial of service situation, somebody's giving you lots of forged messages, then can you throw those forgeries away? If you have encrypt, then authenticate, then if you get a forgery, you just check the authenticator, throw the message away. And that's cheaper than doing an encryption, a decryption of the message. Can you do something like this, where you get protection against the message number being reused, and the forgeries are still fast to throw away? Another direction people have looked at is having integrated authentication, like OCD mode, or Helix, or Felix. I don't know whether having message authentication built in, so you have some, these designs have some state where a plain text block comes in, the state encrypts the plain text block into ciphertext in an invertible way, and that plain text block modifies the state for the next block. Now, can you do that in a way that's still secure if your message numbers are repeated? Obviously, the data flow has to change, but can you do this efficiently and have some very fast, lightweight, have some you know, good performance, integrated, <coughs> authenticated encryption mechanism, whether it's some mode like OCD or something designed all at once like Helix or Felix, can you do that in a way that's not broken by the message number being repeated? Can you do it in a way that allows forgeries to be rejected quickly? I don't know. Maybe there's a good way to do this. One possibility would be, this is not really satisfactorily answering things, but something you could try is to have a, a block cipher, four round five spell, HFFH. HFFH means you do a lightweight hash at the top, lightweight hash, lightweight, a very efficient, say a polynomial hash at the top, polynomial hash at the bottom. And you put all your strength, all your defense in the middle two rounds, the FF rounds. And the only job of the H's is to make sure that there's no internal collisions inside the input to the second round and working backwards the input to the third round. Now, if you have an HFFH block cipher, then that top H looks very much like what people want to do for authentication. Authentication modes, people do some very simple transformation of each block and then say add up the results and, that, and then encrypt that one sum to get an, an authenticator. And so that the top level of a sensible encryption mechanism looks very much like what you want to do for an authenticator, or for what you want to do for this SIV mode. You can also use the last stage. You can use the last stage for authentication. And I think you can get both of these requirements if you want to have your authenticator being, say, 256 bits instead of 128 bits. But that's quite a, a bandwidth limitation, so I don't think this is a really satisfactory solution. But this is just one of lots of directions that 
people have been trying things like this and people have been um, <coughs> making lots of obvious improvements in performance and security over ASGCM. So just to summarize, ASGCM is obviously not satisfactory for all the users. It's something where the performance could be better, the security could be better. And if we don't worry about the security now, we're going to get people who eventually can get something with okay security and good enough performance, and then they're going to get broken by the next round of attacks. Well, we've already seen nonce reduce attacks. You could have, if you like building modes and you want to do something better than ASGCM, you can certainly make a, a better mode than uh, ASGCM, even if you still use AES and still use GMAC. You can also make a better Mac than ASGCM, something that's, say, much faster in software, easier to protect against side channel attacks, or even faster in hardware. You can make better ciphers. AES, again, is, is certainly not the best that we can do. It was okay for the 90s, but um, hey, we know a lot more now about cipher design. Or you can put everything together, make a, a big integrated, authentic, preferably small, integrated, lightweight, uh, authenticated encryption system. If you're interested in any of these things, then some of you have heard, in case any of you have not heard, uh, there is a uh, Caesar competition coming up. So this stands for Competition for Authenticated Encryption, Security, Applicability, and Robustness. The main web page for this is competitions.cr.yp.to, and then you see on the left side things like Caesar and Frequently Asked Questions and stuff like that. There's a mailing list for it. This is the main place for public discussions of what are the requirements and what are the desiderata. If, if anybody's uh, from industry and has some ideas of, okay, here's what I would like to see for authentication and encryption doing better for us, then this is the right place to tell people about it and say, please, please give us a better cipher. We're not happy with AESGCM, and here's what you could do better for us. NIST has uh, burned themselves out on competitions for the moment, but they have been nice enough to provide some funding. So there's a cryptographic competitions grant, which is making sure that there's things like workshops and um, uh, software benchmarking and such uh, all going to be handled. Uh, of course, this is uh, not an infinite amount of money, so if people want to scrape up more funding to keep this running nicely, then uh, that's, of course, appreciated. Happy to chat with people about how to get funding for uh, authenticated encryption generally and for this competition in particular. Um, let me finish off with just briefly showing you, I'll skip past a review of the uh, older schedules and just say the most critical date for the moment if you're interested in designing a new authenticated cipher, so authenticated encryption system, the deadline for submissions will be the middle of January 2014. And then a month after that, you should have the software uh, done. And then the round two candidates will be at the end of 2014, and round three at the end of 2015, and so on for uh, through the end of 2014. 17. Last slide that I have, workshops. We've already had a 2012 eCrypt funded workshop on directions in authenticated ciphers, DIAC. And there's going to be, well, thanks to this NIST grant, there's going to be uh, forthcoming workshops. Unfortunately, NIST money can only be used for the US. Uh, but hey, if you're scared about more money, you can have workshops outside the US as well. Uh, DIAC 2013, we're looking at Chicago either before SEC Crypto Chess or right after SEC Crypto Chess. If people have any scheduling requirements, now is a great moment to say that. And then there's already been some volunteering for running DIAC 2014 in California, close to crypto, and then 15, 16, 17. Well, there's, there's the funding, just uh, don't know yet where those will be. All right, so if you're interested in authentication and encryption, then uh, Caesar's great moment for you to show off what you can do, and then starting in January 2015, uh, sorry, January 2014, that will be a great moment for you to start breaking everybody else's submissions to this. That's it. Thank you for your attention. Quick questions for Dan. In the back. Yeah so, yeah, so the comment was that the Z1 distribution, which I will get back to in a moment now, 
Uh, also, <coughs> fun things happening here. Yeah, so the Z1 distribution, if you look at that Journal of Cryptology paper from Sengupta and Maitreya and Paul um, and Sarkar, then you will see a theoretical curve which goes uh, down and up and up and down and is sort of like the actual curve shown here. It does not explain the positioning of the curves. I mean, it does explain a down and up. It does explain an up and down. It doesn't explain how far down it's going, how far up it's going. It doesn't explain this spike. It doesn't explain any of these little spikes. So it's certainly a big step forward understanding where some of these effects are coming from. But there's also a huge amount of RC4 biases which are totally unexplained by the theory so far. And yeah, for people who are interested in RC4, RC4 has been, of course, studied by more cryptanalysts than AES, more papers than AES. Some people would say this means it's more secure than AES. And if you like doing that stuff, then understanding what's going on in, in this graph, and in this graph, and in this graph, um, I, I'm, I'm sure there's tons to do to understand why RC4 is producing these distributions. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. Thank you.